and welcome to the Brookdale Visiting Writer Series show. My name is Suzanne Parker. I'm part of the creative writing faculty and English faculty here at Brookdale, and I direct our Visiting Writer Series. Today on our show, I am so excited to have with us the author of the book, Residue Days, Mitchell S. Jackson. He also is the author of a short story collection and a forthcoming collection from Scribner. His book, Residue Days, is this incredible story of family and love and trials and just it, it's really a gut-wrenching incredibly written story that has gotten a huge amount of acclaim and attention so we are really excited Mitchell to have you on the show thank you thank you, you. I think we met at Mike McGregor's book party yes for the launch of his book whose name I cannot remember but about it, that wonderful poet oh man now oh god I was hoping you'd remember, but it was incredible, yes. and it's Mike McGregor's uh, response to this poet. But at that point, Residue Days was not out yet. No, it was out. It was out at that yeah, point? Yeah, Or had it just come out? Um, let's had... see, Michael's book was out like two years ago, so maybe my book was like for like a year. It was just, it was, and it was hitting, and I just, the book has, has, has gotten so much acclaim and so mm -hmm. much of attention. And I'm wondering what the experience of having a debut novel out uh -huh. that has gotten such incredibly positive feedback has been like? Um, I think, um, well, I had a lot of high hopes for it. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I was kind of green about uh, debut novels and, uh -huh. and um, the process and what was possible and what wasn't, and so I thought everything was possible. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah. <laughs> and everything yeah. became possible, so yeah. worked out. Well, I mean, I, you know, I think um, I'm thankful for what happened, mm -hmm. um, but there were always moments where I was like, oh, that didn't happen or this didn't happen. But I think every, that's like most writers mm -hmm. um, have that sense. But I think the, the, what was most important to me was the day that I um, revised my ending. And then mm -hmm. I, I remember I said to myself, like, I think you did it. Uh -huh. And I just got up in my apartment, I started dancing around <laughs> and, uh, and then I remember I had a meeting with my editor uh -huh. and I went in to the office and she said, you got one. Oh, that's great. And so those two moments, they really set the tone for everything else. Everything else was like icing. Once I told myself, like, you did it, yeah. that was really what I needed. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, can, can you tell us about the book, the story of the book? Yeah, so... Um, the genesis of the book mm -hmm. is that I was in prison mm -hmm. and uh, I, was, I was also a college student. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to do something constructive with my time. And so I started writing down um, really my autobiography. Mm -hmm. um, and I decided that I was going to fictionalize it because I thought that I was writing things about people who um, it, they might get in trouble. Um, yeah. So I started doing that and then I got out and I went back to college and I finished my undergrad and I still had those pages but I didn't do was it, a, it Was it the book or was it more just notes and No, I thought it was going to be a book. Life. I was like, yeah. it's going to be my, this is going to be, my life story is going to be a bestseller. Not really yeah. knowing anything about book publishing, not really even wanting to be a writer. And I put them away for a few years until mm -hmm. I went back to, well I didn't go back until I saw a graduate program was starting at Portland State, which is where I met Michael McGregor. Oh, okay, yeah. Sure. Yeah, and so um, I took him out, and, uh, and then I wrote some, like a short story to get into the program, and all the while, I went to two graduate programs, and all the while I was working on this book, mm -hmm. um, teaching myself how to write. Like, I hadn't wrote any fiction ever. Uh -huh. um, I hadn't read much fiction. And uh, I just kept working. And even when I finished um, graduate school, so I went to Portland State, I finished there. Uh -huh. I went back to back. So I finished Portland State like, I don't know, July of, must have been 2002. Was this an MFA? This is a, in the, it was an MA, MA but it was really writing. an MFA. Yeah. Um, so I finished in 2002, July, and then August of 2002, I was in a program at NYU. Their MFA program? Yeah. Oh, you really did. I did really back went to back, back to back. Yeah. Wow. Is this because you had the energy of the book and you just wanted to stay in that space, in that energy? It's because I didn't know how to write. Okay. When I was when I got in and I knew 
that I felt like I had promise, but there was no way that I was going to be ready to publish mm -hmm. after two years. I was playing, I've been playing catch up the whole, you know, 15 years now that I've been um, pursuing this as a career. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I went to NYU. I had a thesis. This was my thesis in both yeah. programs. But I really didn't get going on the book, I would say, until 2008 when I met Gordon Lish. Okay. Um, and so I studied with him for really, I think it was just two years that we actually, that I was in his class. Was this at NYU? No, this is afterwards. So I went to a place called the Center for Fiction oh, in New okay. York, yeah, just yeah. like a, you know, a, a writing program mm -hmm. that was happening during the summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gordon kind of singled me out as a person of promise. Mm -hmm. And and I think that was like um, what that to me got the momentum that wow. that finally got the book published. I've heard he's a great editor. He's a great editor, yeah. but he's like a well, I don't want to say more than he's a great editor, but equal to him being a great editor is his ability to motivate hmm. and his ability to um, instill a philosophy in you. Like he really. I don't want to say he wins you over. He like overtakes you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I felt. Really did you need that? Did you feel? Because um, you sound pretty motivated already. Yeah. Right. Well, I was motivated, but it's it's one thing to like be motivated. I think it's another thing to understand the craft mm -hmm. in a way that he teaches it. Mm -hmm. um, and now I tell my students like, you write out of a philosophy. Like you write out of things that you believe in or don't believe in. Um, and I was still kind of formulating the philosophy when I met him. Mm -hmm. And then for the things that I maybe intuited or um, weren't sure about, for, them to, for me to find them in him, for him to articulate them the way that he did mm -hmm. to me was like sustenance. Oh. Now by philosophy, do you mean life philosophy or literally on the craft? Um, it's both. Both, yeah. Yeah, so it's like, so one of the things that I believe is like, I'm always trying to tell the truth. Like I don't really have make believe stories where I'm like writing about robots or fantasy fiction and not to say but that there's, there's anything the alien wrong with in that. There. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> so, so to me, he talks about like writing for your wound, hmm. right? So what is the thing that scares you most? That's the thing that you need to be talking about. Mm -hmm. And I took a while for me to come around to like, okay, I think the wound might, might be my relationship with my mother. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that gives you a kind of power because once you start to write from your wound, it's like, well, you've already exposed the most fragile place. Mm -hmm. What can anyone else do to you? At this point, yeah. yeah. Well, I love the fact that like for even the, the title of the book, mm -hmm. it, a novel, yeah. is scratched out. Yeah. <laughs> and you said, you know, you don't really make stories up. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering about um, the relationship of the book to autobiography, memoir, yeah. fiction. I mean, we know that the publishers want to find the niche to market it right. in. But I think even as much, do you care about those distinctions? How did they influence the craft? Um, well, I do care about them. And it is actually fiction. I mean, it's, there is, it's the center of the story, the nexus of it is a true story, right? Mm -hmm. My mother fought addiction for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I sold drugs for less time. Mm -hmm. I had two brothers um, and we were, you know, struggling to kind of um, make sense of our lives. Mm -hmm. So that part is true, but um, a lot of the things I either exaggerated or changed some things around. Um, but I, I think um, that one of the things that I believe is that a fiction writer has the most tools. Mm. And so I'm glad that I didn't come to the page via memoir because I think the fiction writer has a freedom that the memoirs doesn't necessarily have. And you have to learn scene and dialogue and narrative and metaphor and all of those mm -hmm. things that you need to write good fiction can transfer to memoir, but I don't know. I think you can be lacking in some of those skills if you came as a memoirs, or mm -hmm. even though I think poetry is probably the highest written form, mm. you could be like a lyric poet and never know how to write a narrative. Mm -hmm. So I was happy to come the way that I came to it because now I feel like it gives me 
much more freedom on the page. You said at the start, though, that these, this started out as little scraps of autobiography. Yeah. So did you ever consider just it's a memoir? Yeah. or? Well, when I started writing this in 1998 in a state prison, I didn't even know memoir existed as a category. It was either this was a true story or it was not a true story. And I said, well, if I tell a true story, I'm in trouble when some other people are in trouble. So then there was only left to me fictionalizing it. I didn't know the categories, autobiography, memoir, essay, mm -hmm. history. I didn't, I didn't know. Yeah. So it was in part to protect people and it in was part a, just not having been exposed to, yeah. to that. I wonder um, how you came to the ending of the book. Um, I mean, was that hard? Were there different endings? Yeah, lots of endings. That's why I said, especially if it comes from you, it. like you're still with us. Yeah, haven't. So like, yeah. Um, well, one of the things that uh, Lish used to talk about was this idea of recursion, mm -hmm. and he used to say uh, the way that he explained recursion is what comes next is always behind you. Hmm. Um, and so I think one of the things that a fiction writer does some fiction writers do, is when they get to the end of the novel, they are thinking what comes next. Mm -hmm. They're thinking future, where is this going beyond this point? Yeah. And I think sage advice is to look at what you have put down before that, because I like to think of an ending as a loop back to something that's already gotcha. occurred. And I think that gives you a satisfaction and also gives the reader a satisfaction. This is, is great because we have to, we're going to loop back after yeah. the break. <laughs> okay. We're going to take a break. I'm uh, uh, speaking with Mitchell Jackson. Please come back to us after the break. Let's go! The Brookdale faculty here, they really want you to succeed. They really want to see you reach for the stars and push you beyond your limits to make you into the person that they see in you and that you may not even see in yourself. Finding a friend or finding a mentor and somebody that you've once viewed as your teacher and somebody that you can now go to, not only with school stuff, but with life stuff. I know that Brookdale has prepared me to transfer to wherever I want to go and I can't thank them enough for that. During my time at Brookdale, I'd say I blossomed into a, a great young man. I ended up joining the Honor Society here, which led to scholarships and opportunities outside of Brookdale and after Brookdale. I learned how to study. I learned how to get in touch with the professors the right way. The extra help is very key. You have to take advantage of the services that they offer here. Brookdale changed my life, and I thoroughly believe Brookdale can change yours. I graduated from Brookdale in uh, 2014, and I just graduated from Rutgers Business School. I was working two, two part-time jobs, a little bit over 30 hours a week, while attending school at Lincroft and the Freehold campuses full-time. I was fortunate enough to get a good internship in the city, which helped me continue to finance my education in my second year. I faced so many challenges that had I given up, I wouldn't be where I am today. I applied here to Brookdale as a civil engineering major. Brookdale is a great place to start, especially for someone that comes from a small high school. The class sizes are small. Teachers actually take the time to learn your name and engage with you. I interned at TNM Associates. They offered me the internship again this summer, and I have a job lined up on receiving my bachelor's degree. My Brookdale experience has given me the courage to step out of my comfort zone and pursue dreams I never imagined faculty here, they really want you to succeed. They really want to see you reach for the stars and push you beyond your limits to make you into the person that they see in you and that you may not even see in yourself. Finding a friend or finding a mentor and somebody that you've once viewed as your teacher and somebody that you can now go to, not only with school stuff, but with life stuff. I know that Brookdale has prepared me to transfer to wherever I want to go and I can't thank them enough for that.
Hi, and welcome back to the Brookdale Visiting Writer Series show. My name is Suzanne Parker. I direct the creative writing program here at the school, and I'm here talking with Mitchell S. Jackson, author of, most recently, the book The Residue Years. So welcome back. Thank you. The book alternates. The book's incredible. First off, I mean, I have to say, like, I'm an incredibly fast reader. Mm -hmm. You know, I can I can cruise through this book in a day if I've got nothing going yeah. on and a big cup of coffee. Yeah. And this book just slowed me down. Yeah. It went, no, no, no. You're gonna you're gonna take your time here. Yeah. This is gonna take, and it was great. I didn't want to speed through mm -hmm. it. Um, the voice and the style. It, it's so lyrical, and at the same time, it really meshes in just sort of a lot of slang. Mm -hmm. Um, and the rhythms of it, and I just thought, is that the way you naturally write? Like you put pen to page and put fingers to keyboard, and this <laughs> this music comes out. Um, I guess how much did you work for that? Uh, I think I. It's definitely a composition, mm. but um, one of the things that I realized, I think, a lesson that was um, really important to me was when I, my first year at NYU, and I read a guy named John Edgar Weidman, mm -hmm. who has a short story titled Weight, uh -huh. and it starts off- Is it in heaviness or is it not W-A-I-T? Both, what okay. W, no, no, W-E-I-G-H-T. Oh, okay. And um, the story starts off, my mother's a weightlifter, you know what I mean? And just that, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. I hadn't seen it on the page in like a serious, book of literature. Yeah. And so when I read it, it was like, oh, wow, this guy, he sounds, this narrator sounds like my uncles and my father. Uh -huh. um, and it really was like um, a license for me to kind mm -hmm. of um, excavate what was already there for me that I just had been ignoring uh -huh. all that time. So my father and my uncles and my cousins all speak in that kind of poetry. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the influence of me being in academia, you know, for so long. Mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely, I wish I could talk like that, but um, it's, it's, it's always listening. Mm -hmm. It's always listening. And I, I like that you said you had to slow down because there are okay. times when I'm intentionally twisting the syntax so that a person has to slow down while they're reading it. Like that's a not all the time, but there are definitely moments when I'm like, okay, how am I going to get them to slow down? I'm going to change this. That was conscious then. Yeah. Oh, well, you slowed me down. Yeah, well done. Good. <laughs> <laughs> you slowed me down. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Wow. I mean, it, it, it seems very constructed. Yeah. You know, I mean, often talking to my creative writing students, um, like prose writers, and not to, not to say mean things about prose mm. writers, but, you know, they, they've got a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. And then you find these these prose writers who are writing like, I don't want to say like poets, because that puts one above the other, but mm -hmm. just word by word, it's so crafted. I think of like Tim O'Brien's, yeah. you know, some of the things they carried and mm -hmm. the road to, which I always mispronounce, Sacchiato. I yeah, think. I was talking about that book yesterday. Yeah, it was just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And when I had him on the show, he had said, you know, I, I build my stories word by word. I don't move until the next word and mm -hmm. they work. Do you find that that's your process as well too when you're writing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, um... I mean, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's an exercise in listening. Mm. And it's also like an exercise, and I don't play instruments, but it seems to me like it's something like jazz. Mm. It's like putting a sound with a sound. And I think a lot of fiction writers worry about meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and I care about meaning, but sometimes I get to meaning through sound. And mm -hmm. I think that's something not a lot of people are willing to try. Mm. They'd rather say something really what they think is brilliant or smart rather than to say the true thing in music. Mm. Um, and that's to me like music is first. It, it, actually, that was my next question then. Would you, would you find that your work, the most important aspect of your work, and you may not be able to answer mm. this actually, I realize it's mm. potentially a silly question, <laughs> but to me, um, Grace and Champ, the mm. mother and the son, are, are just such vivid, incredibly detailed, sketched characters mm -hmm. that the plot seems even kind of secondary to these yeah. people. Yeah. Um, what is it for you that's the primary thing in your writing? Is it the are, is it the characters? Is it the language? Um, or is it like I can't separate it? No, it's well. I think that's different because they were based on myself and my mother. Yeah. So 
um, I, I, especially for her, I wanted the fidelity to, well, she's really a composite of women in my family, but mm -hmm. I wanted, it was really important to me to maintain the fidelity to how they behaved, how they mm -hmm. talked, the experiences that they'd been through. Um, but I really come to the page for the language. Um, I want to, I want to hear myself making music. I want to read myself making music. I want to see how far I can push it. Mm -hmm. I want to see what I can take away from myself and still do it. Um, it's like almost like an experiment every time. But I have been writing nonfiction. Mm -hmm. So with the, the new book, with the new book, survival math. Yeah, survival math. So that begins with an idea. Right, so uh -huh. then I'll, I'll get the idea down and then I'll say, okay, now I have to go back and make music, which in the fiction, it might come the other way around where mm -hmm. I can just kind of start playing around with the sentence. Yeah. But um, I, I like both of them. Um, it just takes, I think, a different, it's a different process. Sure, sure. Are you ever writing and, and you're, you're tr you know, working on a sentence and you mm -hmm. get a sentence and you're just like, oh, do you know it? It's yeah. like, yeah, I got that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the time, all the time I read it to myself and I go, okay, yeah. this is what I wanted to say, how I wanted to say it. Like, it would be, I, re I remember, um, I think it was Barry Hanna saying something about like how he wanted to write a novel with no missed notes, with mm -hmm. something akin to that. And that would be like, to me, the ultimate, like every sentence you read had some kind of acoustic value, but yeah. which is not to say that all of them are flashy yeah. because you, you need breaks, right? Sure. Like you can't keep having these like twisted syntax. Yeah. Um, but I think to like really pay attention to everything you put down, like that's, that's the goal for me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, it's so successful in this book. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, and I wonder, you alternate between Grace and Champ mm -hmm. and Grace gets to open and Grace gets to close the book. Yeah. And even their voices are different, yeah. you know, even with that. And I'm wondering, was that always the structure? I mean, the book evolved no. over time. How did you land on that? And why does Grace get to talk last? Um, well, I think Grace gets to talk last because Champ gets to talk first. Mm. Um, and uh, I landed on the alternating characters after probably eight or nine years of trying. Because, you know, this again, this was my thesis project. Sure. This was all the, every time I was submitting in a workshop, I was submitting from this well, most times. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I tried first person and second person. I tried an epistolary. Mm -hmm. I tried an omniscient. I tried present tense, past tense, future tense. I mean, I tried everything. Was it with ever this book. just Grace? It was never just Grace. It, oh. was, it was just Champ. And I realized that that was a dishonest story mm -hmm. and that Champ's greatest conflict was his mother. So I had to give her a voice. I was just scared to do it because I knew it meant more work for me. Yeah. That's the wound as well too that you talked yeah. about earlier. Wow. And Portland's huge in this book too. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of driving. You yeah. drive around <laughs> on neighborhoods yeah. and you know, there's a, an incredible sense of this neighborhood. Even the mm. mall gets yeah. a lot of description. Yeah. And I'm wondering about the importance of place in your work or Portland in particular. I mean, it's everything for me because yeah. one, I'm trying to mm, create a memory of a place that really doesn't exist. Like this, mm. the Portland I'm writing about is absolutely gone. Like Northeast really? Portland does not exist in that way. There are different people there. It's, it's completely changed. Is it gentrification? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, yes, it yeah. is. For the, it, that's the most simple way to describe it. Yeah. yeah, it's gentrification. So I'm trying to like say, uh, um, I think at the heart of most of my writing is like, we existed. Mm. Right. It's mm. just like, here we are. We existed. We deserve to have a story about our lives as well. Yeah. Um, but also I take it very seriously that there are few, if very few writers of color mm -hmm. from Portland. Like there are people who have like they came there in high school and or they mm -hmm. might have came there in college or they're teaching there, but like born and raised. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh I actually don't know another one. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Huh. Yeah. Um, will Portland be in future work then? Portland is at the heart of everything, everything. I write. Yeah. Wow. So survival math is all about Portland, Portland too. I mean, it's the too. people in Portland, but 
everything is grounded in Portland. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what you're talking about in a way seems like a poetry of witness. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you think of your work as political? Um, the new book is absolutely, yeah, I think of it all yeah. as political. Some yeah. of it is more overtly political. Um, Can you tell us about the new book? Yeah, so it's um, Survival Math is a collection of essays in which I employ the survival stories of my family uh -huh. to speak to cultural issues. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll take, for example, my mother's addiction and I'll use that to talk about the history of drugs. Mm -hmm. um, I'll take, uh, what's another one that I did? So my father, one of the guys I said spoke like a poet was mm -hmm. actually a pimp for a mm -hmm. very long time of his life. So I use him to talk about like the sex trade. Mm -hmm. um, and then as a project, what I did is I, um, I took 16 men in my family mm -hmm. and I asked them the same question, what's the toughest thing that you've survived? Yeah. So I took a portrait of them and I interviewed them and I asked them the same question. So then I took their answers and I wrote second person narratives. So I run the second person narratives with their photos, but I never tell you which story belongs to which man. So, you have, oh, so challenge, it's, really challenging the assumptions. It's right. That's exactly yeah. what I wanted to do. Well, that sounds. When does the book come out? Uh, August of 2018. Oh, that sounds fantastic. So it's yeah. called Survival Math. Survival Math. And Residue Years is an incredible book. Thank so you. I urge people to, to go check it out. Um, thank you so much for being Thank on you the for show. inviting me. And this is Suzanne Parker. If you'd like to know more about the creative writing program here at Brookdale, we have classes for everyone. So please check us out online. And thanks for watching.